Hello everyone, you're watching the channel Stories of Our Life. Friends, make yourselves comfortable. I wish you to truly enjoy listening to this life story. The impact was so powerful that she instantly passed out in the stranger's arms. He quickly pushed her into the car, got behind the wheel, and drove quickly out of town, glad for the beginning of the snowfall, which could hide his tire tracks from possible pursuers. The man was clearly afraid and in a hurry to get rid of his passenger. Damn, 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 he repeated, scolding himself for miscalculating his strength, just what I needed. Dusk was falling on the city, and the yellow light of the streetlights illuminated the curb and the rare oncoming cars rushing into town. The man really wanted to step on the gas, but he was afraid of attracting someone's attention, and therefore, gritting his teeth, he drove without violating traffic rules. Only when he turned onto a country road did he speed up a little. It took him at least an hour before he dragged the woman's emotionless body into the deep woods and left it there, in a deep snowdrift. And then he hurried away, blessing the intensifying snowfall in his heart. Once he got to his car, he drove out onto the highway and just there dialed the phone number he remembered by heart. Well, the voice on the other end of the line asked, did you get everything done? Yeah, just like you said. She didn't remember you? I guess not. Well, all right, I've got your account funded. Don't call me again, get rid of the phone. Got it? Yeah. Got it, boss, the man nodded contentedly and after a couple of hours he turned onto a busy highway. He stopped only once to throw away the machine that had become unnecessary. Feelings, not thoughts, were the first to penetrate the shroud that enveloped Sophie's mind. God, it's cold, she was unable to think, but only felt her frozen body shake with small shivers. Then consciousness began to return to her. Slowly, in short fragments, vivid images replaced each other. It was as if they had been painted in watercolor on glass. It's so cold, but why? Sophie did not come to her senses immediately, and when she woke up, she could not understand where she was for a long time. An icy terror ran cold down her back. When she tried to move her hand, her fingertips scratched the melted snow. Sophie began not only to perceive her surroundings, but also to wonder where so much snow was coming from around her. Why did her head hurt so much? As Sophie opened her eyes with difficulty, she saw, through the ice flakes hanging from her eyelashes, the snow-covered forest around her. God, what is she doing in the woods? Sophie realized that the first thing to do was to get out of here. Away, away, away from here. Sophie stood up, staggering, and looked around. Everywhere she turned her head, her gaze strayed to the trees. I wish I could fall into a warm bed now, curl up and go to sleep. How she wanted to sleep. Sophie realized that she owed it to herself that she was still alive. If for the past few years she had not practiced tempering, not bathed in icy water, not led a healthy lifestyle, she would have seen nothing of it by now. Unintentionally, the slightly belated thought that she was about to be killed pierced her consciousness. But to whom had she crossed the road? Unless, no, it couldn't be. It wasn't long ago that Sophie was doing well. Her success was envied, and Sophie thought that the white streak in her life would last indefinitely. Sophie glanced around the hall where the meetings were held. It was quite large and cozy. Smoothly walked through this hall, a quiet, almost homely life, with soft flooring underfoot, with stained glass windows carefully separating the life here from the November, cold outrage. On the small tables at which the club's guests are seated, blue, linen tablecloths, yellow napkins with a monogram, the club's logo. The white stripe Sophie liked very much and she adjusted the folds of her dress at the knees and sat in an armchair at the table from where she liked to watch the guests. Sophie had once created it for people to meet here, have a good time, become couples, and find their happiness. She liked to feel like a fortune teller, because she thought she could tell at a glance who was 100% right for who. Even Victor he was a short, balding man in a strict business suit and expensive rimmed glasses. Like most people, he dreamed of a long-legged young girl with model looks. Victor, do you really want to share the fate of unhappy men who tie their lives to typical beautiful dolls who are interested in nothing but pleasure? 
said Sophie to him at the first meeting, you are a serious man, and in a few days you will be tired of her idle chatter. You, Victor, need an intelligent woman who can match you in everything, not a dressed-up, empty-headed woman. Victor raised his eyebrows in surprise, realizing how cheerfully and freely the club hostess had penetrated his thoughts. Pay attention to Grace, Sophie, meanwhile, continued, you see, there at the table, a pleasant brown-haired woman with a soft smile. I know her to be a wonderful companion, a splendid hostess, and simply a delightful woman. What's more, she's young, she's only a little over 30. Believe me, a Victor, she would make a great match for you, just hurry up. As far as I know, Ian, one of our guests, is interested in her. He's not here yet, so don't waste time, lest you regret it later. Victor kissed Sophie's hand delicately, and within minutes she saw him talking to Grace, who was blushing with pleasure. The woman was laughing, her eyes gleaming with joy, there was refinement, sophistication, mystery. And yet Sophie had managed with such difficulty to lure her into her club. Of course, no Ian existed, Sophie had just made him up, because nothing activates men like a competitive spirit. Yes, she had cheated, but why would anyone know that? Sophie smiled. Watching Victor and Grace from her seat, she was sure that marriage was inevitable, and perhaps soon they would be even closer together. Happy guests were the perfect advertisement for the club. May it always be so. So it looks like Reina, who recently divorced her second husband, has already found her next husband. Now the victim of her charms is 50-year-old electrician Jimmy. Jimmy prefers younger girls, and Mary just recently turned 55, as if she's a straight-A student. Well, who knows, you never know, love, as they say, is a spontaneous and totally unpredictable feeling. Sally was perched on the sofa in the corner and next to her was Caleb, who had been trying to find his other half for six months. Sophie sighed. She had talked to Caleb many times about his preferences. He himself was almost 40, didn't play sports, made little money, and lived with his mother. Nevertheless, he was looking for a successful and young girl. Sophie tried to hint to the man that he should lower the bar, or he'd still be alone. Sally came to the club for the third time. It was noticeable that the girl still felt a little uptight. According to the rules of the club she has every right to say no to her beau so as not to get her hopes up, but Sally has a problem with that. Why does the young journalist need Caleb? Why does she diligently maintain a conversation with him? Sveta, with her looks and education, can count on a better option. Is she afraid of offending him? Sophie made a note in her notebook. We'll have to emphasize the rules of the club to our guests next time. The woman looked at the round clock hanging on the wall, under each number a heart was depicted. Sophie really liked that clock and it seemed perfect for a dating club. True, her husband, Ben, scoffed at it and said the watch looked too ridiculous. But what could he possibly understand about love affairs? The time was approaching nine, it was time to call it a night of dating. Sophie turned off the speakers, which were blasting soft, soft music, and got up from the table. Dear friends, we'll break up in 15 minutes, those who wish may exchange contacts or even, Sophie winked, we should arrange for our next date in a more appropriate, romantic setting. The city, overrun by autumn, was shrouded in fog in the mornings, and in the evenings was flooded with warm, barely audible rains, rustling like mice in a rustic house at night. Sophie would return home, breathing in the scent of the crusty leaves beneath her feet, gazing up into the floating, tired gray sky. How much of her life was connected with this city? The woman smiled at the flood of memories, and there was much to recall. The meeting with Ben, her husband, was like a bright flash. She remembers the moment when they, as applicants, stood in the crowd, looking at the lists of happiness in the lobby of the Institute. Huddled shoulder to shoulder, they greedily read through the list of names. Stopping at the letter N, at the same time, they turned out to be namesakes. I got in, the girl shrieked happily. At that moment, they looked at each other, and that's when it broke out. Ben came to his senses first. Are you Sophie Nett? Yes, I am, the girl nodded. And I'm Ben Nett. So, shall we go celebrate the admission, Sophie? Let's go, Sophie nodded to him. 
And so all five years of college passed. Happy years, studying and loving until they were dizzy, and everything seemed easy and easily doable to them then. And when a person feels that way, that's how things work out for them. The future was shaping up to be a crisp and clear picture of a color movie. Sophie had admired Ben from the very first day she had met him, and readily admitted that she herself would never claim anything else. He knew how to step forward without stopping, without turning around, without reflection. He was not embarrassed by difficulties or steep turns of fate. One must cross over the obstacle and go forward. And only forward. You just love me, okay, Ben, she looked into his eyes one day, do you promise me? I promise, the guy nodded, and suddenly, like a magician, he took out a velvet box with a glittering gold ring in it. And do you promise to be my wife? Yes, Sophie shouted and pressed her palms to her flaming cheeks, Ben, I think I'm going to die of happiness. Come on, you don't die of happiness, silly, laughed Ben. Soon they were married, and then they lived like everyone else for a long time. Sophie felt like she was the happiest, and no one in the world could be as happy as she was. Ben got a job, Sophie, after several unsuccessful attempts to find work, was at home. She was very happy when her husband came home from work, thanking her for the comfort, for the delicious dinner. One day Sophie's mother, who had come to visit her daughter with her father, told her thoughtfully, stirring hot tea with her spoon. Look, when I sent you to college, I didn't think all my efforts would go to waste and you'd want to turn into someone who sits at home all the time. Mom, why would you say that, resented Sophie, I like to do housework. My girl, at your age you should be busy with yourself, isn't it clear, Naden fluttered her arms, glancing expressively at her spouse, you should be in society, surrounded by people. You have to socialize with them and go to different events and work, after all. Her father, Edward, sitting quietly in an armchair with a cup of tea in his hands, did not react at all. He had long been used to his wife's antics. She was 15 years younger than him. He, like a little child, coddled her like a favorite toy, and fulfilled her every desire. As a result, Naden became unbearably capricious and desirable, not tolerating the slightest objection, always insisting on his own. Sophie understood that arguing with her mother was useless. Mom, Ben makes good money. Of course, we're not millionaires, but we don't need anything. Understand, my dear, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Many women don't go to work because they don't have enough money. No, they do it to feel needed, to look good, to socialize with other people. Let me explain it to you in more detail. Look, your Ben works for a good company. Right? But it's not a purely male staff. I'm sure that his female employees are very different from you, they are well-groomed, they smell of good perfume, not cutlets, and wear beautiful things, not bathrobes and tracksuits. Now, daughter, compare their image with yours. Right now, mother, tears gleamed in Sophie's eyes, Ben is not like that. Why are you talking trash about him? Why, you silly girl. I'm not talking and I'm not saying Ben will necessarily cheat on you, but I've lived a long enough life to know men well. Over time, many of them stop appreciating what is finally and irrevocably theirs. Look, a certain man bought himself a car. It is wonderful, comfortable, beautiful. At first he takes care of this car, but when the euphoria passes, he pays less and less attention to it, although he continues to drive it. And there are so many newer, fresher cars around, and his own car no longer seems as perfect as it used to be. After all, a man is used to looking for flaws in his car and only virtues in other people's cars. I hope my allegory isn't too hidden? Sophie sighed and answered nothing. I, all right, Naden waved her hand, daughter, one day you'll know what I'm talking about. In the meantime, do yourself a favor and get a job. Someday you'll thank me for it. Sophie shook her head, but a few days later she did have this conversation with her husband. Ben was against it at first, after all, he liked coming back to a comfortable home where his wife greeted him with a delicious dinner and perfect order. He didn't want to give up those comforts at all. Why did you even think you needed to look for a job, he asked his spouse with a frown. I just thought that, she began, but her husband understood without words. What, 
mom and dad were coming over, were they? Hope set you up for that, didn't she? Well, if that's what you decide, Sophie, I won't argue, Ben spread his hands and laughed, after all, it's not in my plans to quarrel with your parents, especially my mother-in-law. So, do as you please, my dear. Sophie hugged the man by the neck and kissed him, and two weeks later she got a position as a laboratory assistant in the English department of her native university. It wasn't until a few years later, when Sophie went on maternity leave, that she truly appreciated her mother's advice. Oh, Veronica, I can't imagine how much I used to love staying at home, Sophie told her friend and colleague who came to visit her and the baby, Mark is teething, he's so restless now, I can't get away from him. Sometimes, can you imagine, I don't even have time to make Ben's dinner. Even though I'm home all day. Honestly, I'm really looking forward to going back to work. I'm so tired of everything, I just don't have the strength anymore. That's okay, time will pass quickly, Veronica reassured her, I've raised two, so I know what I'm talking about. You take Mark to daycare, and come back to us yourself. Oh, I can't wait, sighed Sophie, rocking her son in her arms. Soon Sophie returned to her native pulpit with a cake and a bouquet of flowers in her hands. My God, Sophie, what is this? I marveled Nicholas, her boss, to work like a holiday. Exactly, she laughed, filling the vase with water, dear Nicholas, you have no idea what maternity leave is like. It seemed to me that the whole world had shrunk to the size of my apartment. True, from time to time it certainly expanded to the size of a playground, but it is so small. Yeah, I don't know, the department head shrugged, my daughter had her third child and doesn't seem to be going to stop. Well, here, as they say, to each his own. In any case, I'm glad you're back, and so, let's wait for the late staff and have tea with your wonderful cake. Sophie's life was back on track. Of course, like all young mothers, she often found herself on sick leave, but Mark was growing and his health was improving, and Sophie began to feel like a completely happy woman again. Her husband Ben's career continued to take off. His father had been on the ball, he had turned on old connections, and his son was well enough settled, close to his specialty, but the place was decent, in the city government. Soon Ben's career became very successful. Sophie admired her husband, not even aware of his influential connections. Six months more and Ben took a position in the information technology department. Ahead of him was a supervisor's position, which her husband was moving toward with confidence. Sophie was proud of Ben's success, adored her young son, and was sure it would always be that way. Trouble came when it wasn't expected. Shortly before Sophie's 30th birthday, she was summoned by Nicholas. She thought he wanted to congratulate her on her anniversary and had prepared words of thanks in advance. But what she heard shocked the woman. It is unfortunate, dear Sophie, but I have to inform you that you have been fired. Management is streamlining jobs, and your position is being made redundant. But how so? Sophie blinked at a loss, and who's going to prepare the class materials, make the schedule, and so on. She choked on a lump in her throat. I understand, but I'm sorry, the head of the department said, looked at her cautiously wary, and added, Sophie, this is the order of the management, there's nothing I can do, alas. You can work your allotted time, and then you will simply be fired. Am I the only one getting fired? Sophie asked. No, there are several other people with you, but what does it matter? Sophie nervously bit her lip, and really, what is there to say when there is basically nothing to say? For so many years she had come to work, thought she was needed, willingly followed all requests and errands, never turned anyone down, and suddenly now she wouldn't be here anymore, she wasn't needed. Well, what is it? Sophie sobbed into the phone, Veronica's call coming in handy as ever, I don't know what to do. Don't get so upset, you'll get a new job. Yes, of course, Sophie sorrowfully stretched out, try to find one. I'll be 30 in a few days, half of my life has already been lived. Veronica, do you think there are plenty of employers out there looking for exactly like me? Veronica, I don't know how to do anything, you know what I mean? I could go as a secretary as a last resort, but who wants a 30-year-old secretary? 
You talk about your age like a serious illness, Veronica said indignantly, Sophie, wake up, at 30 your life is just beginning. You're smart, beautiful, you have a caring husband, a wonderful son. Forget about your institute, start from scratch. Everything will work out for you. Good for you to say, you're doing just fine with your job. So what, Sophie, it's the same thing every day, students with papers to grade, term papers, lectures, diploma, and it's all in a circle. And now you're going to have something new. You won't believe it, but I even envy you. Of course I wouldn't believe it, she smiled sadly, it's so hard to lose the stability you're used to. The conversation with Veronica calmed Sophie down a bit, but at home she cried again, complaining to Ben about the injustice. Why are you getting so upset, her spouse smiled, stroking her head, Sophie, it's okay, and downsizing, well, what can I say, it happens. You'll find something new if you want it. Ben, I feel like my life is over. I don't know why I feel that way. Okay, honey, let's do this. I'll buy you and Mark a trip. Do you want to go to the sea? Do you want to go to a health resort? You'll rest there, you'll unwind, and you'll calm down, after all. And when you come back, we'll think about what to do with you. All right? Okay, Sophie nodded, just don't buy us trips. Mark and I will go to my mother's, I haven't been there in ages. Dad will spend time with his grandson, take him fishing or something, and I'll just relax. We'll be there for a week and then we'll come back. We'll just have to make some arrangements with the school. Wait, when do you want to go, said Ben. I don't know, maybe Thursday or Friday. No, no, that won't do, he objected, it's your birthday, your anniversary, Sophie. But the woman only waved her hand. I'm not in the mood for anything. I don't want to celebrate anything, and dear, don't insist, please, or I'll cry again. Ben did not argue and did what Sophie wanted him to do. But still he gave her a gift, beautiful gold earrings, which the woman had dreamed of for a long time. Sophie raised her hand and touched the earrings. Yes, she was still wearing them. God, then, at 30, it seemed to her that life was over. Now she was 45 years old. And she thought that everything was just beginning. A cab pulled up to the bus stop, Sophie settled in the back seat. It was a 20-minute drive home, which meant she could go back to her memories. It was a good thing the cab driver was not talkative at all. Sophie smiled. Her favorite song came on. She often put her performer at her club. The woman's thoughts went back to the day she first thought of having her own business. The idea came to her a couple of years after she was fired from the institute. Sure, Sophie had tried to find a job and landed a few jobs, she even held on to one for almost a year, but it just wasn't the same. Sophie knew she wasn't ready for a chore, a paperwork job. She was exhausted, she lost weight, and the bad mood began to come back to her more and more often. All because she just wasn't happy with herself. It was all decided by chance. Sophie sat at home looking through the job paper, circling the ads that interested her with a red felt-tip pen. Mark's son Mark was in school, Ben had gone to work. Suddenly the phone rang, and Sophie answered it. It was Veronica, who had once worked with her in the same department. Sophie, hi. How's it going? Did you find a job? No, I'm looking. What happened? Did the boss decide to rehire me? No, just calling to see how I'm doing. The women chatted for a while, finally Veronica moved on to the topic that prompted her to dial Sophie. Listen, Sophie, it's a delicate matter. You see, I'm tired of being single, I'm 35 now, and I've never been married, Veronica was silent. Sophie raised an eyebrow in surprise. Veronica, what do you want from me? You want me to find you a spouse? Well, your husband's kind of a programmer, he probably has a bunch of single co-workers. Can you introduce me to someone? At first Veronica's suggestion seemed ridiculous to Sophie. What do you mean, an introduction? Bring a single programmer to the university and point the finger at Veronica? A plan suddenly matured in Sophie's mind. 
Veronica, how about this, we'll have a little party at our place, movies, wine, and dominoes. I'll ask Ben to invite someone, and you come. Get acquainted, get to know somebody. And then it's up to you. What do you say? Deal, Veronica rejoiced, Sophie, thank you, because I was getting desperate. In our department, you know, all women. Of the men only the head, and Patrick is a graduate student. Patrick is definitely not an option, Sophie laughed, he gets so much female attention, in my opinion, that all the female students are in love with him. You don't say. Okay, well, call me when you decide to get together. I'll be there for sure, Veronica said. In the evening Sophie laid out her plan to her spouse. Ben hesitated. But we have one, Paul. He often complains that he can't find a decent girl. He was married, sort of, but they sort of got divorced. So, why is that? Sophie inquired busily. And you're looking for a potential suitor, no mystery or flaw or something, laughed Ben, he didn't make much money, his wife found a richer one and left. It's all trivial. Is he good looking? It's okay, Ben replied without going into detail. Well, okay, call your Paul and a couple of other people for backup, or it'll look like an outright matchmaking, Sophie smirked. Well, all right, you Cupid, Ben stretched out with a sorrowful sigh, that's why I can't refuse any of your requests, tell me, for heaven's sake. The impromptu party took place the following Sunday, Veronica came in her best dress, Sophie had only seen her in it once before, when the department celebrated New Year's Eve. The woman got a haircut, dyed her hair, did her makeup, and looked quite dignified. Paul was really interested in her candidacy and volunteered to walk Veronica home. Sophie was pleased. Was her plan really working? A week later Veronica called and told her that Paul had asked her out, to a restaurant, and most likely had very serious and far-reaching plans. Sophie wondered how many other lonely people there are in their city, who just can't find their other half. Online dating is dangerous, scammers, sham pages. But what if there was a place where pre-selected candidates who dream of finding a husband or a wife come, rather than a one-night stand? Sophie decided to try her hand at creating such a club. True, there were many complications and problems, from renting space to the legal status of the future club. But with the help of her husband, Ben, Sophie was able to achieve her goal. She named her club, The White Stripes. The name seemed ridiculous and ridiculous to Ben. A white streak, like on your sweatpants or something, he teased his spouse. No, silly. A white streak is the period that comes after a black streak in everyone's life. Loneliness ends and marital happiness begins, Sophie replied to her husband. At first there were not many people who wanted to come to the club. Most of them were lonely women, desperate to meet a real man, but there was a catastrophic lack of men, and women discussed problems with children and parents, exchanged recipes, and found new friends, but not life partners. Sophie was getting desperate, so she decided to ask Ben to recommend her club to her colleagues. Oh, Sophie, they'll think my wife is a matchmaker. They'll laugh, he replied to her request, but, toward his wife Ben did go. Single men began to come to the club. The first romances began to take place between the guests. When the first wedding was played between men who had found each other at the White Stripes, Sophie rejoiced. Just a little more, and her venture would begin to generate income. Veronica, too, received a marriage proposal from Paul. At the wedding, she let her guests know who was the guest of honor at their celebration. Thank you to my friend Sophie for helping Paul and I find each other, Veronica said as another toast. The frozen snow scratched the frozen woman's hands, apathy rolled in, a relentless shiver forced action. It was urgent to get out. And it had to be done not only to find her salvation, but more just to keep moving and keep living. She understood that if she fell now and gave in weakness, then there would be no strength to get up. Suddenly Sophie had a bright thought. How had she gotten here in the first place? She hadn't come here by air. Someone must have brought her here. There must have been some trace of her in the snow. Sophie lowered her eyes and peered closely. There it was, a path stamped by someone's feet. 
Staggering with each step, Sophie moved along the chain of footprints. Her body was barely audible, and her frozen feet struggled to move. It was beginning to snow. She had to hurry. Soon the fresh snow would cover the tracks, and then Sophie would not be able to find her way. She was tired, shivering. Her lips were chapped from cold, and her nose now and then began to run a thin stream of hot blood, leaving scarlet drops in the snow. The woman stopped. She wiped her face with a handful of snow and continued on her way. The forest was silent, and that really frightened Sophie. When some huge bird flew up from a fir tree, cutting the frozen air with its wings, Sophie screamed in terror. But suddenly her cry froze on her lips. Somewhere far away she heard a lonely, pitiful howl. It was long and so piercing that steel hoops of fear squeezed the woman's heart. Oh my god, are those wolves? The twilight was beginning to grow darker, but Sophie would not allow herself to despair, because in her situation it meant certain death. And yet she so wanted to live and find out how she got here. That was not the last thing she wanted. Sophie began to look around helplessly, but she couldn't find any shelter in the darkness, slightly illuminated by the white snow. The wolf stopped howling, but within a minute another one was answering him from the side. Sophie felt as if the voices of the beasts were closing in on her. She thought she could see the angry embers in their eyes, or maybe they were flies in her eyes. Of course, there was such an unpleasant ringing in her ears, she sometimes gets like that if Sophie gets really anxious. So the day Mark had told her and her father that he was getting married, Sophie had felt the same way she did now. And if Ben hadn't picked her up then, she would have fallen at the feet of her son and husband. They both quickly got her into a chair. Mark ran to the kitchen and got his mother some water, and when she said she was feeling better Ben lashed out at his son. Well, why are you scaring your mother so much? Couldn't you have presented the news neatly somehow? Dad, what's the big deal? I'm an independent, grown-up man, and I'm already earning my own living. Why can't I get married? Did I tell you you couldn't? I just asked you to take care of your mother. Nothing, son, Sophie said, it just sounded very sudden somehow. Well, come on, please tell me about your chosen one. Do we know her? Who is she? Yes, I was just about to introduce you, Mark smiled softly, but mom, anticipating all the questions, I'll tell you right away that Julie grew up without parents. She was raised by her grandmother until she was 12 years old. Then, when she passed away, Julie was put in an orphanage, because none of her relatives wanted to take her in. Now Julie works as a seamstress in an atelier, she is only a year younger than me. Oh, my god, Sophie couldn't hold back a sigh of disappointment, Mark, why exactly this choice, son? You've had so many girls. And every one of them was smart and beautiful. What didn't you like about the others? I don't know how to explain it to you. Although, in your line of work, you must understand everything yourself. Yes, I understand, son, but you, please, don't compare adults who are looking for their mate and yourself, just a young guy, though already independent. How about you tell me what the difference is, the corners of his lips quivered in an indifferent, mocking smile. Son, you'll know the difference when you're about 40, but for now, just listen to me. Stop talking about getting married. I'm sure you'll change your mind very soon. You've done this more than once with your girlfriends, you've had one, you've had another, Sophie said, lighting up her son and husband with a peaceful smile. Yes, mom, that's all true. But, I'm getting married for the first time and hopefully the last. So please don't talk me out of it. Did you regret marrying daddy? Well, what are you talking about son, sighed Sophie, your dad and I had a very different story. When we became a young family, we had help from our parents at first, they even gave us an apartment. Ah. Uh. Mark grinned, that's the thing. But so don't you worry, Julie has an old house. True, it's not in the best part of town. But it's still a place to live. So we do not need to buy an apartment. We will live there. And Sophie looked at her husband helplessly. Ben, why are you silent? Is it all about me? Really, Mark, the father asked his son, and have you thought carefully? 
Marriage is a big responsibility, isn't it? Dad, don't start, Mark frowned. And Sophie suddenly noticed how much they looked alike. And they looked alike not only in appearance, but also in facial expressions, and in mannerisms and character. She sighed exhaustedly. There was clearly no way to change her son's mind. Okay, Mark, Sophie said after a moment's hesitation, bring your Julie to us this Saturday. We'll get to know her. And Mark smiled cheerfully, kissed his mother on the cheek and left the room, and Ben turned to his wife and looked at her intently. So, what do you think about all this? I have a lot on my mind, Sophie admitted, you know, I was always afraid he was getting married because of the baby. What are you smiling at? He's a handsome boy, there are plenty of girls around him, and Mark's prospects are good, after all. After all, he's graduating in physics and mathematics. I'd hoped his career would come first, not his marriage. Imagine, one day I couldn't even stand it and started talking to him about the methods of modern contraception. And what did he tell you, laughed Ben. Nothing, Sophie waved her hand, he acted just like you. He laughed at me, that's all. Well, you're a real mom, Ben couldn't calm down, who picks on a grown guy with questions like that? Well, if he were 13 years old, he'd be. Sophie remained silent, she had actually thought of something. Except she didn't tell her husband about it. When the doorbell rang on Saturday, about half an hour before dinner, Sophie asked her husband to meet the guests. Ben complied with her request, and stood on the threshold, unable to utter a word. Before him stood three girls, one better than the other. Smiling dazzlingly, the guests greeted Ben, but Sophie herself had already hurried out into the hallway. This is Linda and Betty, she introduced the girls, they help me at the club to receive guests. And this is Lily, perhaps the most beautiful guest of my club. And this, girls, is my husband, Ben, Sophie lit up everyone with a peaceful smile. A pleasure, added the man, finally getting over himself. Lily shook her red curls, her green, foxy eyes lit up with pleasure. You have such a charming wife, Ben. And I'm very pleased that she invited me to visit you. Her voice sounded like a crystal chime, scattering soft notes in the air. Well, shall we go to the table, then? Ben made a broad, welcoming gesture with his hand. We should wait a little longer, Sophie said thoughtfully, we're waiting for Alan and Nick, these are Mark's classmates. And, of course, him and Julie. Left alone with his wife for a moment, Ben tugged at her sleeve. I understand you want to ruin the matchmaking by inviting these dolls here, but what are the guys for? You got that right, honey, Sophie adjusted her husband's shirt collar, Mark will compare his Julie to other girls. And let Julie look at guys and realize that there is someone else in the world besides our son. Ah. Uh. Well, what a clever move, replied Ben admiringly, is it worth trying so hard, Sophie? Well, Mark fell in love with a girl. Love is a very delicate feeling. You must understand that you must treat it with respect, with understanding. Love can befall everyone at any moment, Ben looked at her warily and cautiously, as if he knew in advance that Sophie would not accept any of his arguments. You've always underestimated me in general, Sophie flicked her husband lightly on the nose, deliberately letting his words pass her ears, all right, dear, I'll go into the kitchen and see how my pies are doing. You go see the guests. Soon Alan, Nick, and almost followed by Mark and Julie arrived. Sophie's son's fiancé reminded her of a small, disheveled sparrow. The girl smiled shyly, perplexed at the company she was in, and then finally turned to Mark and whispered to him. But you said there wouldn't be anyone but us. Mark, let's go, I don't feel comfortable. Julie didn't have time to finish because Ben came out and without much persuasion took Julie with him. He introduced her to the guests and then sat her down at the table. Mark had no choice but to follow them. Fortunately for Julie, Alan and Nick and Linda and Betty were quite at ease, keeping the conversation going, constantly drawing Julie into it as well. Mark's heart thawed, he understood who had orchestrated all this. Sophie, on the other hand, bit her lip in frustration, she had not anticipated that things would not go as she had planned. So when Linda and Betty said their goodbyes a couple of hours later, Nick and Alan walked them out. 
After another half hour, Julie thanked Sophie and Ben for their hospitality and got up from the table. But Mark didn't beg his girlfriend to stay. On the contrary, he announced to his parents that he would be home late tonight and very quickly went out the door after his fiance. Lily was the only one left. The girl watched everyone with interest all evening, smiling quietly and hardly engaging in conversation, allowing herself only to answer questions if she was approached. A distraught Sophie, seeing the guests off, restrained herself in front of Lily with the last of her strength. And the girl felt the awkwardness of her position. Thank you, Sophie, for a wonderful evening, she appealed to the hostess, honestly, I'm sorry it's over. I haven't been in such pleasant company in a long time. Should I call you a cab? Ben asked. No, no, that's all right. I've got a bit of a headache. I just want to walk through the park, get some fresh air. When the door closed behind Lily, Sophie looked at her husband with a tired look. We've seen off all the guests, I think. Sophie, I wanted to talk to you, Ben began. Let's not do this now, dear. I'm terribly tired and just want to lie down. Will you show Lily out? And try not to slam the doors. I might be asleep by then. Ben looked at his wife carefully and nodded. Well, all right, lie down, get some rest. Yeah, I'll just load the dishwasher. No need, I'll come back and do it myself, Ben pronounced, kissing his wife on the top of her head and Sophie obediently made her way to the bedroom. Ben, covering her with a soft plaid, left. Sophie closed her eyes, trying to cope with the nasty ringing in her ears. She wanted to cry, but there were no tears. She was just stung from within by pain and some strange premonition. Yes, if her son knew how unpleasant it was to have his mother's arguments rejected so mercilessly. She herself did not notice how she fell asleep. She awoke only in the morning and realized at once that Ben was not there. Sophie got up and hurried to find her phone to call her husband, but when she went out into the living room, she saw that he was asleep on the couch, hugging his pillow tightly. The woman smiled. What's the matter with her? He just didn't want to disturb her when he came back. Stepping quietly, she walked to the kitchen to make coffee and smiled again, a mountain of dirty dishes covering the table. Ben never kept his promise, simply forgetting about it. Sophie was already finishing cleaning up when a sleepy husband walked into the kitchen. I'm sorry, dear. I completely forgot, he nodded at the dishwasher. Yeah, I figured that out already, Sophie shrugged, okay, I'm not mad. Do you want coffee? Yes, I will, Ben reached out, I don't feel well, I don't know how I'm going to go to work. Guess we'll have to leave our conversation until tonight, asked Sophie, pouring coffee into cups. We have nothing to talk about, Ben took a sip of the hot, fragrant drink, divine coffee. Look, Sophie, Mark has grown up and made his choice. I personally respect his decision. I liked Julie. Basically, she's a good girl. Let them get married and be happy. What's the big deal? Well, I've said all I have to say about it, he finished his coffee and left the table. After a while the front door slammed, and Sophie still sat by the window, gazing out into the street. It was raining. Gray, wet five-story buildings lined up. One was a pharmacy, the other was a grocery store. A bus pulled up to the bus stop, stood there with its doors grimly open. Now it would take a long time to make a turn. An ordinary day. Only for some reason that strange feeling came over him again. Going to the mirror, Sophie looked around herself out of habit, turned sideways, and arched her back. She wasn't fat, but she was pretty strong. Her hip line was crisp, there was no belly. So why was she getting herself all worked up? As she went about her usual daily routine, Sophie forgot about her morning worries, but not for long. In the evening, when Mark came home, Sophie walked over to him and sat him down next to her on the couch. Son, we need to have a serious talk. Just please don't take my words critically. I really want to help you, to give you advice, son. Mom, I don't need your advice, Mark looked up at her proudly, and don't waste your time on me, Mom. 
Julie and I love each other, there's nothing you can do about it. Is she pregnant, chilled Sophie at her new hunch. Mom, stop it. If you must know, Julie is not pregnant, but I don't recognize you. You were always so wise, judicious. What happened to you now? I just thought you'd find the right girl for you, Mark. So, what do you mean by a suitable, mom, Mark looked at his mother interestedly, you mean from a good family, right? With a college education? And to have an inheritance too. Sophie remained silent. Mother, my Julie is the best. And don't you pry into our relationship. I won't let you do that. Do you understand, Mark cut the conversation with his mother short and left the room. Sophie rose from the couch. Well, I did the best I could. A few days went by. One day at breakfast Ben said to his wife. Sophie, don't you think it's time we made a change? Mark hasn't lived at home for a long time. I realize, of course, that he's an adult and free to decide his own life, but still, it just doesn't seem right. Why don't we give it another try and invite Julie? Sophie remained silent, and Ben continued. Honey, you may or may not be angry, but I'm on our son's side. Yes, I understand that already, Sophie nodded to him. Since you're in the minority, dear, that means you'll have to put up with it all. Well, all right, I'll put up with it, the woman promised. Well, did Mark tell you that they applied for marriage registration? Sophie looked helplessly at her husband. Like, already? Yes. So get ready for the wedding, dear. By the way, I promise to pay for everything. Mark was against it, but I insisted. After all, I am the father. Yes, you did the right thing, Sophie nodded to him, you did good. Well, I'm glad you're noticing that, Ben smiled. Even though he wanted to celebrate his son's wedding in a big way, Mark and Julie didn't go along with it. We want a modest celebration with the people closest to us, Julie said, what matters to me is that Mark loves me and I love him. Everything else is just a formality. Listen girl, Sophie blurted out, Ben is a well-known man in his own circles, I'm known to many people, too. You know I have my own business, don't you? What would people say if our son got married in secret? Do you have any idea what they might think? What does it matter what people will think of you? Sophie Julie did not concede, as far as I know, people always don't care whether you're good or bad. They're only really interested in what happens to them. Oh, is that so? Sophie couldn't resist a sarcastic remark, you're almost a psychologist. I've just seen a lot in this life, Julie grinned, I know what it's like to go to sleep hungry. I know what it feels like to be a person who is not wanted by anyone in this world, and I know what to do if you are hated. And what should be done in the latter case? Sophie sparkled her eyes. Nothing, replied Julie, go on living. No one, nothing, it is useless to prove it, and it is useless to argue either. In any case, everyone will remain with his opinion. That's my opinion. You say there's no need to argue, but you're arguing with me, Sophie said with a wave of her hands, all right, let's leave it at that. You'll stay with us tonight, and tomorrow you and I will go to the salon, Julie. We'll pick out a wedding dress for you there. No need, Julie waved her hand, I've already found a dress. A friend will lend me hers. It's beautiful and it's quite the right size for me. So it's all right. I'll just have to buy shoes, but I have the money for that. Besides, I'm not going to buy them in a salon. They sell them at the market just as good, but much cheaper. Sophie, hearing this, covered her face with the palm of her hand. It wasn't like that. It was as if this girl had decided to act out of spite for her, but for Mark's sake she had to put up with that, too. Okay, whatever you say, Sophie muttered, and where do you want to celebrate your wedding? In our cafe? Which cafe is that, mother? Mark interjected, we have a wonderful cafe in town. Julie is a part-time waitress there, and I'm a security guard. I'm there to watch the public order. What are you looking at? I've been there six months, Julie a little longer. 
And we decided to save some money, so that we have enough for the first time, until I find a normal job. Julie says we're saving for everything. Honestly, we don't need all this wedding stuff as much as you do. It would have been enough for us to just get married, but you're afraid of being judged by people. So Julie and I agreed to the whole event. Ben. Listen to what they're saying, Sophie said indignantly. Well, he grinned back, it's quite a modern, pragmatic way of looking at the obvious. Mother, you live in the last century and act like a bourgeois. And this is the new generation, it is practical and adequate. I'm a bourgeois, exclaimed Sophie, and then waved her hand, do what you want. I don't care, no one here is interested in my opinion. I don't understand why we had to have this conversation in the first place. Wait a minute, Julie rose from her seat, I brought the pie, I baked it myself. Mark, you, where did you put the bag? I left it in the kitchen. I'll go get it. Don't, Julie came out from the table, heading for the door, I'll do it myself, I'll cut it up and bring it over. Father and son looked at each other, Sophie's lips pressed together. There you go, that waif is already doing whatever she wants in my apartment, and she's not even Mark's wife yet, she's just his fiancé. What's going to happen next? Julie brought out the pie. Sophie involuntarily cringed, the girl putting it on her favorite dish, without even asking if she could touch it. Did I do something wrong, he guessed Julie, with a look on her future mother-in-law's face. It's just that Sophie got this dish from her mother, Ben explained to the girl, and she got it from her mother, so there's a complicated chain. Julie, this dish is passed down from generation to generation, from mother to daughter. It's funny, isn't it? It's not funny, exclaimed Sophie, and please don't ever pick it up again. Julie's cheeks flashed with scarlet fire, but she remained silent and began to arrange the pieces of pie on plates. In fact, it was delicious. The men ate with gusto, praising the girl's culinary abilities. But Ben's wife, and Mark's mother, barely touched her bite. A lump in her throat prevented her from breathing as well as from swallowing. She also wanted to cry. For the first time Sophie found herself in a situation where her son and husband refused to support her, and sided with an essentially stranger. The pie was eaten, the first family dinner was over. The men rose from the table, remembering to appreciate the skill of both hosts. Encouraged by the praise, Julie hurriedly got up from the table to help Sophie clear the dishes, but did so so awkwardly that the dish she had picked up slipped from her hands and fell to the floor. It shattered with a thud. Sophie shrieked, she felt as if her whole life was about to be shattered. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, Julie cried. Stop it, honey, stop it, Mark began to coax the girl, it's just a plate. Mom isn't mad at all at you. It's okay. Come on, really, Ben encouraged his son, there's no need to cry. It's only dishes. It's just a broken one, isn't it? You what? Don't you both realize that she did it on purpose, Sophie finally came to her senses, what have you done? I told you not to touch that dish. Mark hurriedly led Julie away. Ben glared condemningly at his spouse. Sophie, I'm disappointed. I didn't expect this from you, he turned and left after his son and his fiancé, and Sophie was left alone in the empty apartment. Everyone had abandoned her, betrayed her, traded her for this girl. There are girls like Julie, nature has not given them anything, but they know how to cling to a man. That's where they have no equal. Sophie sank to the floor beside the broken dish and wrapped her arms around her knees. She felt homesick in the large, hushed apartment, as if she were facing trouble. No, life didn't end there, but it was as if it had been cut off now. Floundering in the snowy captivity, Sophie did not cry. She only whimpered softly in fear, like a small, cornered animal. She didn't believe she could make it out of the forest, which held so many dangers. Somewhere wolves kept howling, tearing her soul apart. Suddenly, somewhere very close by, a branch crunched. Sophie stopped and listened. The sound was repeated, and then there was silence. Suddenly it seemed to Sophie that a huge beast lurked behind her, and at any moment it could get hold of her with its huge teeth. The woman slowly turned around. There was no one beside her. 
The scarlet drops stained the snow, and Sophie hurriedly wiped her face again. She was very afraid that the smell of fresh blood would attract wolves or other dangerous predators. And then what would happen? The woman didn't even want to think about it. Meanwhile, the snow began to turn into a real blizzard, and Sophie realized that if she didn't continue on her way now, she would lose her tracks and just freeze to death in this forest. Fear gave the woman strength, and she began to climb again, breathing heavily and skinning her hands. Oh my god, why did I have to go through all this, she pleaded when her strength was completely exhausted, who could have done this to me? Who was in my way? I mean, really, who did I bother? Sophie was reminded of Julie, her sister-in-law. Of course Julie hated her, but was Sophie to blame for that? She accepted her son's choice and even tried to be friends with Julie, but she always took Sophie's words at face value. Julie didn't agree with anything and stubbornly defended her opinion in arguments with Sophie. For a while after the wedding, Julie and Mark lived together with Sophie and Ben. Those were truly nightmarish days. Julie suddenly felt like she was the boss and had her own way of doing things. Sophie felt like she was doing everything to spite her. If Sophie decided that she was going to make potato casserole for dinner, Julie would try to get ahead of her and take over the kitchen. The woman offered to spend the weekend out of town, but Julie, meanwhile, insisted that they just go to the movies. Sophie, as a hostess, planned to do a general cleaning of her apartment, and Julie invited guests in the meantime. One day the woman couldn't take it anymore and exploded, telling her daughter-in-law everything she thought about her. Mark intervened in the scandal, taking his wife's side. Of course, Ben tried to calm everyone down, but he failed. Mark and Julie simply left the house, they decided to go back there, to the outskirts of town, to the house where Julie's family had once lived. Well, what did you accomplish? Ben asked his wife. What do you want from me? Sophie burst out, you're hardly ever home, you only come over at night, and I'm the only one here struggling with all this and I don't expect any help from any of you. Don't you have anything else to do? Go back to your club. You've completely abandoned it. No, I haven't. The club is in full order. I have a good staff, and my presence there isn't always necessary, my wife retorted. Well, so is this place, Ben muttered quietly, which made Sophie look aghast. What did you just say? So you don't need me anymore? Well, go away. Get out now, I don't want to see you. And I will, her spouse threw in her face, you have no idea how sick of all this I am, Sophie, the man left, slamming the door. Sophie cried tears of resentment and anger at her husband, at the whole world. After a while, she did pull herself together. Okay, that's enough. You, Sophie, are behaving like a real hysterical woman. Nothing good can come out of this, which means that you have to clean yourself up. When her husband comes back, you have to ask him to forgive you, and then you have to make peace with your son. Except Ben did not return. The husband did not come to spend the night, nor did he show up in the morning. Sophie called him a thousand times, but the phone was unavailable. Then Sophie dialed her son's number. What do you want, mom, asked Mark coldly. Son, dad hasn't answered the phone for the second day. He's nowhere to be found. I've called all his friends and co-workers. Well, what are you worried about? Maybe dad's at work. Mark, dad is on vacation for the second week. What will he be doing at work, tell me? I think something has happened to him, something bad. Maybe we should report him to the police. Mom, calm down, there's no point in going to the police, the deadline hasn't passed yet. It's only three days before they can take a missing person report. Don't worry, dad will come back, maybe he just stayed with a friend. I don't know son, but I have a bad feeling. Mom, be honest, you and dad had a fight, didn't you? Yes, Sophie squeezed out with difficulty. Ah. Uh. Well, then I understand him all the more. Okay, mom. We'll talk later. I don't have time. Sorry. Mark, wait, Sophie sank to the floor, her throat tightening in a cramp, tears welling up in her eyes. At that time the doorbell rang, and Sophie rushed to open it. 
She thought her spouse, Ben, had returned, but her friend Veronica was standing on the doorstep. Ah. Veronica, it's you, come in. Hi, Veronica looked at Sophie strangely, how are you, she asked Veronica cautiously. The woman waved her hand in response. Oh, Veronica, don't ask. My men have declared war on me. Mark has been totally estranged from me since the wedding, Ben has taken his side. Can you imagine? Things have gotten bad since that Julie came into our lives. Sophie, look, maybe it all happened before, but you just didn't notice anything? What are you talking about now, said Sophie, suddenly alert. Look, I don't want to say anything about Mark. Or rather, I want to say words in his defense. He's a normal guy you have, smart, understanding. If he chose his Julie, Sophie, then she's worth it. And if I were you, I'd stay out of their way. I'm not, Veronica, Sophie waved her hand, I've put up with the situation for the sake of my son. Only it's Julie who hates me for something, I think she has disliked me since the first time we met. Oh, Veronica grinned, that's when, instead of a cozy, family dinner, you had a viewing party, right? I remember, I remember. But I'll tell you what, my friend, you were looking in the wrong place, dear. You shouldn't have been looking at your son, you should have been looking at your husband. What? Sophie jumped up in her seat, nearly knocking over the table where she had just set everything up for tea. Yes, yes, girlfriend. And don't be surprised. Ben has a mistress, and has been for a long time. He never missed an opportunity to have fun on the side. But it wasn't serious. And now he's got a real predator. She's got her hooks in him and won't let go. Look, haven't you noticed anything? But how could you? You, Sophie, reduce people to each other, and you haven't noticed such misfortune in your own life. Veronica, Veronica, I don't believe you, Sophie shook her head. Well, that's up to you, her friend agreed, but I couldn't not warn you. Okay, I'm going to go. Veronica wanted to get up, but Sophie held the woman in place. Wait, she said in a muffled voice, sit down, please, and tell me everything you know. Why did you keep quiet if you knew such truths about Ben? I didn't know anything until last night, Veronica sighed, otherwise I would have told you. Anyway, my sister invited me to her birthday party. It was her anniversary, and she decided to celebrate it in a restaurant. I came with my husband, everything as it should be, handed the gift, sat at the table. Blair was greeting other guests, and I look, she accepts flowers from Ben Yor. I was happy, I thought you were here too. I thought we'd have a chat, we'd sit down, we hadn't seen each other for a long time. But it wasn't. Banyar sat down at the table with some young woman, beautiful, red-haired, with long legs. Next, Sophie whispered to her, what happened next? Anyway, I froze like that. And my husband told me to pretend like you didn't know him. But I asked my spouse who Ben was with. You work together, I said, he must know. Husband and said it was his mistress. Her name is Lily. And then he told me that they have been dating for a long time. But Lily is no ordinary girl, Ben has been dating her for two years. He even went on vacation with her once to the sea, and once to a ski resort. Can you imagine? And Ben said he was going with friends, Sophie's eyes sparkled with tears, I believed him, trusted him. How could it be, Veronica? What am I going to do now? Sophie, I don't know, her friend answered her honestly, I would kill mine, but you decide for yourself. So he's been cheating on me for a long time, Sophie said thoughtfully. Well, yes, it turns out it has been a long time, Veronica nodded. Her name is Lily, isn't it? The girl with the pretty, red hair? Well, yes, I told you. Veronica, I know someone like that. She used to come to my club, spend evenings with us, and once was at our house. Veronica, is that really her? Quite possibly. The name is rare, and with that red hair, it's hard not to remember. Sophie suddenly laughed. So I was the one who insisted that he escort her then, Sophie's laughter was replaced by bitter sobs. Really? 
and Ben's good, too, sighed Veronica. And he hasn't been home for two days now, Sophie said excitedly, I've called all my friends and acquaintances and hospitals. Everyone must have laughed at me, too. I was the only one who didn't know that he'd cheated on me and that he had this lily now. Veronica, Sophie grabbed her friend's hand, and can you find out where she lives? I want to go there and see for myself. Please ask your sister. And I'm sorry, I want to be alone now. Yes, yes, Sophie, I understand, Veronica nodded. Sophie closed the door behind her friend, walked to the kitchen, stood at the sink, pulled rubber gloves over her hands, opened the faucet, put a cup under the water pressure, and suddenly something twitched inside, a breathlessness rushed to her throat. Damn it all to hell with these dirty dishes, and a heavy sob came from the woman's chest, why, why should I have all this? The woman pulled off her gloves, went to the window, folded her arms under her breast, and squeezed her shoulders sorrowfully. How long she stood like that, Sophie did not know. Finally, staggering, she went to the bathroom, where she washed her face with cold water for a long time. The woman's heart ached with unbearable pain, or perhaps it was the pain of her deceived soul. Sophie lifted her head, meeting the blank stare of her droopy eyes in the mirror. That's it, she said to herself, once you thought your life was over at 30, but you were wrong. You were wrong, dear Sophie, by 15 years. Look at yourself. Now you are 4-5 and no one needs you, not your husband who betrayed you, not your son who just walked out of your life. What do you have? A house, but it's empty, cold. A club? No, it's all such nonsense, it's not real. You wanted to make people happy, Sophie, and you lost your own happiness. Who's going to believe you now? Who's going to trust you with their destiny, Sophie? Congratulations, my dear, you are the most ordinary loser. Sophie wiped her face, then took out a bottle of expensive wine, which she kept especially for guests, and opened it. Ben returned home and found her sitting in complete darkness and silence with an unfinished glass of wine in her hand. The bottle was almost empty. Wow, Ben tried to joke, how unexpected. What are we celebrating? We're celebrating a funeral, Sophie grinned, I'm burying my happiness. What nonsense is that? Ben crouched down beside his wife, Sophie, it's going to be all right. I'm not mad at you anymore. See, I'm here, I'm all right. And with her. Is she all right? Who, her? You're Lily. Did you think I wouldn't find out? You cheated on me, Ben. Explain to me why. What were you missing? How could you do this to me, Ben? Sophie went into the most real hysteria. She couldn't help it, she threw her glass at the wall, and a dark red stain instantly blurred on both of her blondes. Ben grabbed her hands and held her tightly against him. Sophie, crying, broke free from his embrace. Get out and never come back here again. I hate you, do you hear me? I hate you. Get your things and get out. Ben expected anything from his wife but this. He was used to her being obedient and submissive, always doing what he said. She believed unconditionally whenever he shamelessly lied to her and, no matter where he returned from, she welcomed him home with a delicious lunch or dinner. She always approved, she agreed, Sophie didn't ask any unnecessary questions. This was the way it had been for them from the start, and everything Ben did was accepted in their family as right. The man had long ago become convinced of his impunity, and when he lost his guard, he made a mistake. Well, of course he didn't have to go with Lily to that birthday party, but he couldn't refuse her. He couldn't refuse her at all, for she drove him crazy. Ben was flattered that a girl like Lily fulfilled his every desire and gave him her love at his first call. It was different with Sophie. Sure, there was intimacy between them two, but his wife was no match for Lily. Lily was a hurricane and Sophie was. What was Sophie? She was just his wife. And at the same time Ben wasn't going to give up on Sophie. After all, he was comfortable with her. Ben was used to the clean, iron clothes he could always find in his closet, to the delicious, homemade food, to the comfort and order Sophie created just for him. Lily could hardly provide that for him. 
Ben was satisfied with everything, and he didn't want to change anything, so he tried to make peace with his wife. Sophie, what Lily? What are you talking about? Come to your senses. Who told you all that nonsense? Stop lying to me, cried Sophie, I know everything now, see? I know about the time you went to the sea and the time you vacationed in the mountains. That trash, when she came to my club, she told me all about it. Can you imagine how much nerve she has? And you too. I'm asking you to leave. Otherwise I don't vouch for myself. Sophie, Ben made another attempt, but she pounced on him like an enraged tigress. I said get out, get out of here. Right now and don't ever come around here again, do you understand? Do you want a divorce, he gritted through his teeth, come to your senses. Who's going to want you? Do you want to face old age alone? Better alone than with a mean man like you, she cut Sophie off and pushed him out the door. There were no more tears, Sophie reached the bed, collapsed on it, and sank into a restless, anxious dreamless sleep. Snowflakes began to fall from the sky, sparse at first, then thicker and thicker. Sophie was made nervous by this snowfall. She imagined her body turning blue and bent. First, the snow would blanket her clothes, leaving only the voluminous white outlines of her body, and then they too would begin to flatten, merging with the snow cover. My body gradually began to return to mobility. But the chill did not go away. A step, another step, clenching her teeth, Sophie forced herself forward, falling knee deep in the snow time and again. She would fall, trying to take the next step, then get out again and take another step. Sophie lifted her head and listened. The wolf's howl was gradually coming closer, a hungry pack trotting one after another somewhere out there, sniffing and echoing through the snowy ice. They walked quickly, trying to find something to eat in the frozen winter forest. Oh, my god, Sophie twitched frightenedly as some bird rose from the tree again and flew away. Finally, completely exhausted, Sophie collapsed to her knees. She couldn't walk anymore, and she simply didn't want to. Whoever wanted to get rid of her had one. At that moment, a huge wolf jumped out of the bushes and made a frightening sound with its teeth. Lord, receive my soul, Sophie whispered the words that came to her mind from nowhere and lost consciousness. Sophie opened her eyes. There was silence for a few seconds, and then the bell rang again, and the woman realized that it was the doorbell. She got up, threw her robe over herself with a light movement, fixed her hair, and went out to meet an early visitor. Mark stood on the doorstep and looked in amazement at his mother, whom he was seeing for the first time in such a state. Mom, what are you doing, he asked, I'm sorry I woke you up. But it's almost 10 o'clock, I didn't think you were asleep. Where's daddy? Daddy left, Sophie replied calmly. Why, he's out of vacation already, isn't he, wondered Mark. No, son. You don't understand. He left me for another woman. As you know, it's very hard to live on two families, so he chose another family. But that can't be. Mark shook his head, daddy couldn't have done that to you. But why not? Sophie grinned bitterly, he's gone, and so are you. You don't need me now. You have a wife, and so does he. You made your choice, that's all. I, son, am left alone, all alone. Mama, honey. Don't say that, Mark pleaded, you'll never be alone. Come on, really, stop it, please. Mama, mama, don't cry. You'll find yourself a hundred times better husband. If you want to. Have you forgotten that you have your own dating club? Mark smiled and hugged his mother like a little girl. Yes, she trustingly laid her head on his shoulder. Oh, how she had forgotten about the club. With Ben gone, everything in her life would go down the drain, and the business she loved would have to quit, too. What kind of eyes will she have on her guests at the club now? What will she say to them? What kind of example will Sophie set if she divorces her husband, with whom she has been married for almost two decades? I mean, really, who would want the services of a man who hasn't managed to keep his own family together? Sophie wept bitterly, Mark stroked her head and remained silent. Then the son suddenly asked.
Well, do you even know who he went to? Sophie nodded in response. Yes, son, I do, but what does it matter now? So be it, Mark nodded, but we have our own family now, you, me, and Julie. Yes, Julie, Sophie sighed bitterly upon hearing the name. Mark didn't understand why her mother's mood had deteriorated and continued to stroke her disheveled curls. No matter what happens, it's Julie everywhere, thought Sophie, it's not enough for me to have Ben's antics, it's Julie, too. It's driving me crazy with all this. She thought again of her white stripes club. How unexpectedly you ended up after all. Listen, mom, what I thought of, Mark suddenly said, Julie and I are coming over to your place tonight, we're going to live together. We won't leave you alone. Do you want to come over? I do, Sophie nodded and smiled. She decided to keep her relationship with her sister-in-law neutral, it was unlikely they would become friends and fall in love, but it was still worth a try. To Sophie's surprise, after Julie and Mark moved in, there was no conflict between her and her daughter-in-law. Julie went to work in the morning, tidied up the apartment in her spare time, made lunch or dinner, and had polite conversations with Sophie. That was quite enough. In all the time Ben called only once to talk about the divorce. Sophie listened to her husband and said she was willing to come to the divorce anytime she wanted. If anything, I can even pay the state fee, she said grimly, well, you never know, in case you have all your funds going to a young wife. Sophie, don't be like that, Ben sighed, into the phone. How gentle we are, Sophie grumbled, pushing back. Things weren't going well at the club, though. Rumors of Sophie's divorce had ruined the White Stripes image. Sure, people continued to come to meetings, but there wasn't the same excitement. Veronica tried her best to cheer Sophie up. Sophie, get married right away, she advised her friend, you can imagine what a stunning advertisement it would be for your club. The owner, at 45, wasn't afraid to get a divorce and immediately remarried a successful businessman. What, laughed Sophie, waving her off, what successful businessman? Where from? And you look it up in the database. You're the one who compiles it, and forget Ben yours. Let him disappear, the miserable traitor, along with his red-headed companion. Sophie smiled as she listened to Veronica, but she didn't want to look for a man again. The woman longed for peace. Sophie wanted to forget everything that had happened to her lately, though she didn't know how to do it. One evening, over dinner, Mark made his mother an unexpected proposal. Mom, do you remember when you said you dreamed of a country house? Yes, I remember, there was that, Sophie nodded. She had once had the dream of buying a small homestead outside the city. A cozy little house, a sauna, her own garden. She would grow her favorite roses, set up a gazebo where she would read or work on her club's website. And on weekends, they would gather as a family around a big table. True, those dreams used to include Ben. Now it's just my son Mark and his wife Julie. Of course, nowhere without that Julie. Let's buy a house, Mark pressed into his mother's thoughts, look, we can sell grandma's apartment, plus you had some savings. We'll buy a house, I plan to borrow the car, and I'll drive you there and back. You've got it all figured out, Sophie laughed, but you don't make enough money to take out a car loan. Mom, this is just the beginning, Mark smiled, you think about it. I'm ready to do the repairs myself, if you need Julie to help. Yes, I will, the girl voiced, I know how to glue wallpaper, level the walls. Sophie smiled, the enthusiasm of Mark and Julie appealed to her. Why not? She might as well make her dream come true. She might not have been, but she would have her children. After talking with her son and daughter-in-law, Sophie kept thinking about buying a country house. In her head, she pictured pleasant pictures, here she is in a hammock reading favorite romance novels, watering rose bushes and enjoying their subtle and delicate fragrance. It would be possible to have tea parties on the veranda, sunbathing in the summer. The idea began to seem more and more appealing to her. Sophie began looking for her dream home. She searched through the options, but none of them suited her completely, the commute was too far, the price was obscenely high. But Sophie took her time, she wanted to find the perfect place, in every way, 
and one day her dreams began to come true. The cabin was small, neat, two stories, with a cozy garden, and a convenient location. Sophie called a realtor, inquiring about its value. The price turned out to be suspiciously low. It's just that the owners want to get the deal done right away, they're about to go overseas, she was told on the other end of the line. I see, and when can I come and look at the house? The realtor hesitated. Sophie heard the rustling of papers, most likely her interlocutor was flipping through the pages of a day planner. Wednesday night, can you come over, he said, well, if it's convenient. Yes, quite convenient, Sophie replied. For the viewing, Julie volunteered to go along with Sophie. Mark asked to take as many pictures as he could of the future family home, but could not accompany his mother and wife himself. He was busy at work. But Julie was glad to go. She, normally taciturn, was excited and joyful that day. She chatted a lot about her work, about plans for the future. Sophie suddenly found herself listening to her daughter-in-law with great pleasure. At times she even became ashamed of the girl and why she thought Mark would suit another girl. Not so bad as Julie. But her sister-in-law suddenly saw the look in her eyes and asked an unexpected question. Do you miss Ben? Julie, Sophie squinted at her, what a question. What's the big deal? I just wanted to know. You've lived together for so long and suddenly you're separated. That must be very painful. I wouldn't want that. Yeah, me neither, Sophie nodded, sighed, and changed the subject. Sophie and Julie liked the house. It was pretty, cozy, small, but quite roomy. It was surrounded on all sides by a lawn, there were flower beds at the entrance, and a garden with honeysuckle bushes, apple trees, and cherry trees a little further away. Sophie inhaled deeply the delicate scent of greenery. What else do you need for a comfortable holiday in the warm season? And then who knows, maybe she'll leave the apartment to the kids and move here altogether. Let me show you the house, the realtor offered and led Sophie and Julie behind him, here's the kitchen. All the appliances the owners leave, two bedrooms, one can make a nursery. An attic with a window, there's some junk there now, of course, but if you put a little effort, you can make another room. Sophie couldn't believe her eyes. The price of the house still seemed suspicious to her. For that kind of money you could buy a small ruin surrounded by three acres of land. And here they offered a nice house, a nice renovation, and a well-kept lot. Sophie tried to look for a catch and found none. Only it would be desirable to make the transaction sooner, the man smiled as they re-entered the garden, the owners are just in a hurry. Understand, I advise you to hurry, or you might miss out on this house. Are there a lot of buyers? asked Sophie. Well, you're the fourth one this week. One married couple has almost made up their mind, now they want to borrow money. They asked to hold on to the house, but I promised the owners that the deal would close as quickly as possible. Sophie inhaled the thick, fragrant air and imagined that this was her home. How nice it would be for the three of them with Mark and Julie, and then there would be grandchildren, sure to be boys. And the attic will be their favorite room, and Sophie will turn it into a magical pirate ship just for the grandchildren. Isn't that what every child dreams of? Sophie looked at Julie. Well? What do you think? Oh. Julie folded her arms dreamily, Sophie, if only I had that much money, I would definitely buy this house. It's just some kind of miracle. But I'm afraid that I don't have enough, and the loan may not be approved. By the way, Julie smiled, I can be a part of the purchase. I have something after all, and Julie said the amount. How, the woman wondered. Where from? From my grandmother, the girl blushed for some reason. Okay, look. Let us think a little bit and call you, Sophie said to the realtor, you know, such a decision in five minutes cannot make. And we have to get the money together. Yes, of course, the man nodded, but the house is about to go, I warn you. I'm sorry, but I won't keep it, not even for nice customers like you. He smiled dazzlingly and added in a quiet voice. But you can get a small discount for urgency. And if you pay cash, the discount will be even greater. 
It's a requirement of the owners. I tell everybody that, but I can see you're serious about it. Oh, good. We'll think about it, Sophie repeated. In fact, the woman had already made up her mind, of course, a house like this must be taken. Such a chance comes once in a lifetime, maybe it is fate itself sending her a gift for the suffering she has endured. Life had taken Ben from her, but it had given her this wonderful place. When Sophie returned home, she checked her accounts. Just as she thought, there wasn't enough money, but with Julie's investments, there was even more than she needed. Sophie grabbed her smartphone and opened the gallery to take another look at the pictures of the house. Even the roof is tiled, just as she had dreamed. Sophie squeezed her eyes shut, counted to ten, and then dialed the realtor's number. We've decided we're buying a house. I hope we're not too late. No, no, of course, the man cheered, that means I'm taking the house off the market. You remember about the cash? And I'll give you the documents as soon as you've made the payment. That's all, as a matter of fact. The house will be yours. Okay, Sophie was a little embarrassed by the haste, she didn't want to fall into the hands of crooks, but she was even more afraid that she would lose her dream house. And tell me, when can we meet? Okay, well, let's do it tomorrow, 9am, at our office. I'll text you the address, we'll be waiting for you. Okay, see you tomorrow. And thank you, replied a satisfied Sophie. The office address arrived on her phone a couple of minutes later. Wow, they're located on the outskirts of town. Usually, all the offices are downtown, apparently saving on rent. Oh, and they opened recently. Mark was also somewhat suspicious of the haste with which the deal was made. Mom, maybe we shouldn't be in such a hurry. You never know. They're pushing too hard, like they want you to give the money away. And why cash, exactly, my son asked. Mark, you always suspect everything, Julie hugged her husband and looked up at him with pleading eyes, believe me and your mother, this is a great house, you won't find another like it for that kind of money. Yes, son, Julie is right. It happens. People are in a hurry, they want to get the money for the property as soon as possible. It's a normal practice, Sophie said. All right, Mark bowed his head, as if surrendering to his mother and spouse's onslaught. Son, the house is really, really great. So, a white streak in life begins again, Sophie smiled. The transaction went suspiciously quickly. Sophie had money taken from her and was shoved with documents that she had to sign. After that, the woman was congratulated on her purchase, and she went outside, clutching in her hand the cherished file with the documents, which stated in black and white that from now on she was the owner of a country estate. To celebrate the purchase, Sophie bought a bottle of champagne and her favorite cake. Her mood was buoyant. It is true what they say, fate takes away with one hand and gives gifts with the other. The main thing is not to miss these gifts, to have time to seize their chance. And Sophie did not miss it. At a family meeting it was decided to go out of town the next weekend. Why not, we'll assess the front of work, decide what we need to buy. There's money left, Sophie said, well, let's start the repairs. The house is nice, we won't have to make any drastic changes, but it's all the same. Except that Veronica, whom Sophie called to brag about the purchase, shook her head doubtfully. Some people I know fell for a bargain like this recently, and now they're going to court, Sophie, looking for the truth. Well, what are you, smiled Sophie, Veronica, it's not like I'm a girl. Everything was legally clean, the office has been operating for six months, all the paperwork is in perfect order. Well, God forbid, Veronica said skeptically and began a new tale about her friend who sold her apartment through fraudulent realtors, and was left without a home and without money. Sophie listened to her half-heartedly, leafing through an old album herself, she was suddenly unbearably sad. Here was a picture, she and Ben were not yet married, smiling at each other looking into each other's eyes with incipient interest and hope. Sophie remembered her thoughts. She wanted to know if he was the one she would live for. She had been a naive and enthusiastic fool at the time, believing in a love that, as it turned out, didn't exist. Sophie sighed. 
Yes, she had believed in her husband all her life, and he had deceived her, hiding from everyone his other life in which Sophie had no place. And she, she loved him with all her heart, for his easygoing nature, for his great sense of humor, for his ability to be supportive in any situation. And Ben was a great father, too. When Mark was a baby, he would get up with him at night, take long walks with the stroller, giving Sophie a chance to rest and take care of herself. And how could he do that to her? Hey, girlfriend, are you still there? Why aren't you talking, came Veronica's insistent voice from the phone. Nothing, Veronica, Sophie sighed, thinking about Ben. What's there to think about, snorted Veronica, gone and gone. You know, sometimes I want to know how he is. He doesn't even come by once, Mark calls once in a while, that's all. It's like I've become nothing to him. Sophie looked up to the ceiling to keep from crying, which usually helped, but a tear rolled down her cheek anyway. Oh, Sophie. Veronica sighed noisily, just get him out of your head, that's all. That's easy to say, Sophie managed to notice the hem of Julie's dress flickering at the door. Was she eavesdropping, Sophie's surprise was boundless, but her tears instantly dried. Somehow, she didn't feel like crying anymore, and even self-pity was gone, all that was left was a lack of understanding and anger. Anger at her ex-husband. Her friend had said it right, he was gone, and so be it. All right, Veronica, Sophie said, I'll go take care of business. And on Sunday, come to our place out of town, we have a purchase to celebrate, and Sophie, disconnecting the call, went into the kitchen, where Julie was making tea. Julie, is there anything you want to tell me? Sophie asked the girl. No, nothing, she smiled and looked away, but here, would you like some tea? For dinner Julie baked chicken in the oven and made mashed potatoes, while Sophie mopped the floors and helped her daughter-in-law set the table. Mark returned from work with flowers, one for his wife and one for his mother. Both women kissed him, and Mark laughed merrily. Now that's what I'm talking about. Well ladies, life is getting better. Sophie's mood improved, she complimented her daughter-in-law's cooked chicken, thanked her son for the flowers, and went to bed. The next day promised to be a long one, they planned to drive out to their country house to scout out the front of the work to be done. In the morning Mark loaded his things and provisions into the car. Mom, why don't I get my license and drive everyone myself, instead of you doing it all? Yes, that would be fine. But as you remember, we hardly have any money left, Sophie looked at her son, eager to own his own vehicle, with a smile. Son, let's solve problems as they come, okay? Julie, on the other hand, was concerned about something else entirely, she wanted to plant a flower bed near the house. Hydrangeas, chrysanthemums, marigolds, she enumerated, I want the beds to bloom all year round. Well, except in winter, of course. Can you imagine what a beauty it would be, she dreamed on the way home. Sophie liked her daughter-in-law's plan. Once there, everyone went to explore the house. Sophie was pleased with the bright kitchen, Mark went up to the attic, and Julie explored the rest of the rooms. What a lot of books they left behind, Julie shouted happily, a whole library. We'll have something to do. We'll have plenty to do, Julie, replied Sophie, wallpaper, plaster, you know. No one heard a car pull up outside the house. Sophie only flinched when she heard loud footsteps on the porch. Who's that, the woman grumbled, have the neighbors come to meet them? How sharp looking. She went to the door and swung it wide open. On the porch stood a short man, about 45 to 50 years old, dressed in a light jacket and jeans. He was looking at Sophie in bewilderment and she knew from the look on his face that this was not a neighbor who had come to meet them at all. What are you doing here, the man inquired, who are you? We're the new owners of this house, Sophie tried to give her face as stern an expression as possible. The owners? Aren't you confused about anything, the man frowned, maybe you bought the house next door or your lot in a different township? Do I look crazy to you? The man muttered something unintelligible. Hello, Mark exclaimed cheerfully, my name is Mark, this is my mother, Sophie, and this is my wife, Julie. Julie approached Mark, holding some kind of book in a brightly colored paper cover. Wow. 
A real Tabor, the man grumbled, and I wonder why they rush me with the deal. Damn, what an idiot I am. And maybe you should introduce yourself first, Sophie demanded. She suddenly felt uncomfortable, maybe it was the local lunatic. She should have brought gas cans with her, just in case. More, the man introduced himself succinctly, can you at least let me in? And why should I, Mr. Moore? Sophie answered him sternly, we bought this house, and we don't have to let anyone in. Ah, there it is. The thing is, I bought this house, too. I got the paperwork four days ago. Hold on, I'll get it, Moore walked briskly to the car parked by the fence. Mom, what does this mean, Mark asked the woman confusedly, have we been scammed or something? Son, we have to figure this out, Sophie's voice sounded hoarse and wary. Moore returned a few minutes later, carrying a file folder in his hands. Here, look. I should think you have the same papers, don't you? Sophie opened the folder with trembling hands. And she did, she had the exact same documents. Only they listed her as the owner of the house, and these documents listed a certain more. The man threw up his hands. So what are we going to do? We have to deal with this somehow. How much did you pay? Sophie named the amount. Moore grinned. And I'm 15,000 more expensive. So they gave you a discount, too. Yeah. Sophie nodded helplessly, for the urgency. Yeah, that's nice. So, are you going to let me in, or are we just going to stand on the doorstep? And Sophie took a step to the side, letting her guest inside. Why was she such a fool, both Mark and her friend Veronica had warned Sophie, and she fell for the low price of the house and paid cash, too. We should go to the office, there must be some mistake, Mark said. I guess the office hasn't existed for a long time, Moore waved. They were probably registered to an 80-year-old woman from the next town. But that's understandable. But how did I let myself get fooled? That's the weird thing. What makes sense to you? Asked Sophie angrily. Don't be offended, Moore smiled conciliatorily, but I can see that you are a soft woman, not very knowledgeable in legal matters. But why I was inattentive is unclear. Sophie sat down in the squeezed chair and moaned softly. So what do we do now? I mean, it's not our house, is it? Asked Julie pitifully. I'll call my boys now, Moore retorted. He pulled his phone out of his jacket pocket, held it to his ear. Sophie noticed that his knuckles had turned white with tension. Robert. Yeah? Hi. It's me. Listen, I've got a bit of a situation here. Anyway, I come to my house, and there's a whole Tabor here, Moore glanced at Sophie, who was blushing with indignation, well, I mean, not a Tabor, but three people. They say they were sold the same house as me the other day. Yes, and the agency seems to be the same. Yeah, yeah, Moore nodded, I hear you, come on, I'm waiting. So what's up, Sophie asked, and who is this Robert? Yes, this Robert, the lawyer, at my firm. I should have talked to him before the purchase, not after. But why did I think I was the smartest? Eh, Moore sighed. And by the way, do I address you by your last name, or do you have a first name as well? Sophie rose from her chair and started pacing the room. Yes, I do have a first name, George. What's your first name? Sophie, it's just Sophie. George's phone suddenly rang, and the man stepped out into the garden and talked at length with his lawyer about something. Sophie, Julie, and Mark watched him from the window. Yeah, we're in trouble, Mark stretched out as George hit the buzzer and headed toward the house in quick strides. Wait, we have to figure this out first, Julie looked at Sophie hopefully, maybe he's the one who messed up and is the important one walking around like this, the woman hissed angrily. Okay, well, citizens, he declared as he returned to the house, you and I have become victims of black realtors. Here's what to do. I have no idea. My lawyers will look into it. It's really a one-day office. The information that they are not the first day on the market appeared on the network about two weeks ago and has already been removed. 
And by the way, you paid in cash, too, I guess? Yes, Sophie nodded, cash. Well, so did I in cash. I mean, it's going to be almost impossible to prove that the money was handed over. Now they'll be looking for the real owners of the house to figure out what's what. A good option, if they really sold the house and received the money. Then we will figure out which one of us will be the owner of the plot. But if the owners themselves didn't know their house was for sale, then the situation will get a lot more complicated. And also, we can't rule out that soon someone else will come up, claiming this beautiful farmstead. Does that happen? Julie's voice trembled. Sophie felt sorry for the girl. How she had dreamed of those flower beds that would bloom all year round and then this. She felt pity for herself. She probably wouldn't be able to get the money back, and Sophie thought her streak was over, but no, apparently fate had decided to play a joke on her one more time. Yes, things happen, George nodded, and, you know, quite often. And I honestly don't know what kind of madness has come over me. Crazy since the divorce, I guess. Oh, well, I'm sorry, that's my own problem. Sophie suddenly felt sorry for that insolent George, even though he called her family a tabor. Maybe, indeed, after a divorce, with the stress, people begin to think worse. It probably happens. Listen, why don't we have tea? Sophie suddenly suggested. Tea, George wondered. Well, yes, tea. We all have the same problem. We shouldn't fight and find out who's right and who's wrong. We should just talk. George laughed. You should definitely become a diplomat, Sophie. All right, I'll take my tea, and we'll talk about what to do next and how we should all live with it. While the women were setting the table, Moore kept calling from time to time some people from his work to give information about a successful purchase that had been made by both Sophie and George at the same time. So, news one. The house did sell, George smiled as he sipped his fragrant tea, news too. Legally, we are equal owners. That is, the court will probably give half the house to me and half to you. Luckily, those guys haven't had time to sell it to anyone else, or the case would have gotten a lot more complicated. You'd think it was simple, Sophie stirred the tea in her cup, watching the teapots form an intricate swirl. Uncomplicated, I agree, Moore nodded, but I dare hope you'll meet me halfway. I offer you compensation, partial value, of course, but half and I'll keep the house. Why should I, inquired Sophie, maybe we want to keep the house, too. Especially since we've been saving up to buy it. Let's call the police, fraud should be punished. Okay, well let's not take it to court, George frowned, we'll waste a lot of nerve. Just a month ago, I sued my wife, finished it, and now this. No, no, I a pass. I got divorced recently, too, but I don't shout it on every corner and use it as an argument in arguments, Sophie told him. Oh, and I brought some more roll, Julie smiled, clearly trying to change the subject of the conversation, and will you have some roll? Sophie and George looked at her, but said nothing. Julie didn't seem to think they understood what she was talking about at all. Well, there are two options, said George, after a silence, either we settle the matter amicably, or through the court. I am more satisfied with the first option, you are nice people, though stupid. However, I myself was a fool when I agreed to this suspicious deal. You have no right to call us fools, Sophie said angrily, you're good too, though you have lawyers. Do you know that I have always dreamed of just such a house? And suddenly such a bargain. You think I had no doubts, you think I wasn't afraid? And now what happened? No money, no house, nothing. It's like someone cursed me, and Sophie suddenly cried. Julie moved toward her mother-in-law and put her arm around her shoulders. Mark stood behind his mother's back and put both hands on her shoulders, as if trying to protect her from this, out of nowhere, more that had come down on their heads, and George fell silent, then spoke softly, well, I'm sorry, I'm really only thinking of myself. But you do realize that we're going to have to deal with this house problem one way or another. Sophie wanted to say something back, but she couldn't. She cried as she had when she was a child, noisily inhaling and exhaling air, sobbing now and then. Her son Mark answered in her place. 
Well, why don't we try taking turns resting, at least for now, and then we'll see. Well, yes, George grinned, and we can also make a schedule. Sophie looked up at him in amazement, not realizing at first that he was just kidding. Oh, all right, all right, I give up, the man raised both hands in the air, demonstrating that he gave up, that's fine for now, and then we'll decide. Is that all right with you? I'd never agree to it, but, you know, I can't stand women's tears. Fine with it, Mark cut off, let your lawyers work out how to punish these crooks in the meantime. Sophie calmed down and walked out with George. Mark followed them and reasoned about the need to find the realtor who had defrauded them and brought his mother to this state of mind. Sophie forced a smile out of herself. That's all right, son, we'll be sure to figure it out. George returned from the car. I completely forgot, let's exchange phone numbers, in our situation it's extremely important. Don't you think? I think so, and Sophie dictated her number and then, accompanied by her son, returned to the house. Over the next week, Moore called her several times, offering increasingly large sums of money as payoffs, but Sophie didn't want money. And George only managed to negotiate a schedule of site visits. At first Sophie was pleased that she was able to assert her rights, but every time she went there, the woman felt like she was in someone else's home and this vacation did not bring her any pleasure. Here and there, she came across Moore's things, his books, some clothes. Once he had left his glasses on the table. Julie and Mark, on the other hand, were quite happy with this temporary solution to the problem. They hung a hammock in the garden, bought a nice table and wicker chairs for the veranda. And Julie set to work on the future flower garden, while Sophie felt that it was all a waste of effort and time, Moore was bound to find a way to take the cottage away from them anyway. You can't pretend the problem doesn't exist, even if you really want to close your eyes to it. One time Moore accidentally arrived on the wrong day and bumped into Sophie in the kitchen. Mark and Julie were busy that weekend, friends had invited them to visit, so Sophie went to the cottage by herself, and now George had arrived there as well. Oh, I'm sorry, the man muttered, I think I got the dates wrong, it won't happen again. He headed for the door, but Sophie stopped him. Come on, stay. What can I do with you? The weather outside is lovely, and the scenery is not like the city. Our rooms are different, so I don't think we'll get in each other's way. And I have a pie ready right now. And I have a bottle of good wine with me. Would you like some? And let's, Sophie smiled, in our position, there's only one thing left for us to do, get drunk and forget ourselves. Moore laughed. Well, quite a plan. But, sitting at the table, George clearly felt uncomfortable. Sophie made no attempt to make him talk, only occasionally asking the man unimportant questions, to which he answered her in one-word sentences. Sophie, let's talk like adults, George suddenly suggested. About what? Sophie wondered, about how much you would be willing to pay for us to give you this house after all? Yeah, maybe about that, but it's not my fault it happened that way, Moore sighed as he poured the wine into his glasses. Okay, come on. That way I won't have to come here again. After all, I realize I'm in your way, but I don't want to throw money away either, he clenched his head with his hands, though if you promise me something, I won't demand even that from you. And what should I promise you, asked Sophie, yes, don't look at me with those sad eyes. Sophie looked the man over carefully, and then rose from her seat. Shall we walk to the river, she suggested. The sun was golden on the treetops, and there was a pleasant scent of freshly cut grass and apples in the air. Sophie suddenly felt sad. It is so beautiful here, but why is there no such harmony in people's lives? Here is this George, he seems to be a good man, and he, in fact, is not guilty of anything in front of her. But what about her? Was she to blame him for what she had done wrong? She just wanted to be happy. First with Ben, then with this house she was unlucky. What are you thinking about, asked George delicately, breaking the silence. Just about life, about you, about your ex-husband. About me? George wondered. Well, yes, you see, at first I thought you were very bad, aggressive, angry, even insolent. 
And now, I see that you're not. I see, the man smiled back, and your husband, what is he like? Why don't you tell me? They say if you share your pain with someone, it gets easier. Sophie sighed. Maybe. And then the woman talked about Ben's betrayal, about her dating club, about how she felt she was cheating her clients. Well, how can you promise to help someone build marital happiness when you yourself have managed to miss out on your own? I used to think Ben was the best. Well, now. And now you think he's bad, the man asked. No, not bad, she replied seriously, just ordinary. George listened to her in silence and then muttered. You know, I understand you just fine. Do you? Yes, the man nodded, your husband left you and my wife left me. That, too, I tell you, is not pleasant, of course. She said I was only interested in my work, and she left me for someone else, and took her son with her. You know, the most painful, not even that, but that she did not want to let me communicate with the heir. So I had to fight for the right to communicate with his son. I got what I wanted, I kept dreaming about coming here to fish with Daniel. He was just starting to show himself to me, my mother had told him such nonsense about me. Sophie looked intently into Moore's eyes. Why would she do that? George, so you, well, were guilty of something to her, it turns out? Maybe I was, the man said thoughtfully, maybe, really, I was working too hard. And then there's this business I started practically from scratch. My wife used to tell me that I loved my job more than anything in the world, and I argued with her, proved that it was not so. After all, I wanted my family to have everything I didn't have. I grew up in an orphanage, and I thought that success and money were the most important things. Turns out I was wrong. You can't imagine what I went through to get there. Maybe that's why my character had become so tough. Life, you know, puts its own stamp on all of us. So the road from being an unhappy orphan to being what I am now, I'll tell you, was quite difficult and thorny. But I survived it all. Wow, Sophie said, but my sister-in-law Julie, she too grew up in an orphanage for several years. I didn't want my son to be with her at first, can you imagine? Well, there are a lot of legends going around in society about kids like that, and now I see that you always have to decide for yourself who and what's worth it. Yes, it really is. I always spoiled my wife, said George, I made sure she didn't need anything. I hired a nanny for my son, letting my wife not only get enough sleep, but also go to all kinds of salons, hair salons, spas. She loved to relax with friends, often went with them to cafes, went to clubs, I let her everything and asked only one thing, that she provided me with a life. But I was wrong. And I was wrong about my husband, too, Sophie sighed, it happens. You know what, Moore suddenly suggested, let's not talk about them. Would you like me to read you some poetry? You and poetry, Sophie marveled. Of course, I love poetry very much, he smiled. That's terrific, exclaimed Sophie, I never would have thought you loved world-class poets and quoted them so easily. You amaze me, George. I hope you'll get to know me better someday. I won't stop surprising you anyway," he smiled back. As they walked, the weather began to turn bad. Clouds covered the sky and it began to rain. There was a chill from the river. Let's go home, Sophie suggested, embarrassed for some reason, otherwise we risk getting soaked to the skin. It was quite dark when the lights went out. Sophie brought candles and lit them, and George poured the rest of the wine into glasses. Here's to us, the man made an unexpected toast. Here's to us. Sophie answered him and smiled. She suddenly thought that Moore was a very attractive man and it was strange that she hadn't noticed it before. He looked up and met her gaze. For a moment Sophie thought he had read her mind, and she hurried to bring the glass to her lips to hide the embarrassment she felt. And George reached out, took his guitar, and soon soft melodies were pouring out from under his fingers, telling Sophie of two loving hearts that for some reason couldn't be together. When George finished playing, Sophie, at her heart's call, asked him to play something else. Please. I haven't had such a wonderful evening in a long time, and I don't want it to end. 
George didn't have to beg and played the strings of his shiny polished guitar for a long time, filling the room with soft sounds that were reflected in the mirror of Sophie's wounded soul. What happened next, she long considered a mistake. They rose at the same time to disperse to their rooms, but Sophie, confronted by George, fell into his arms and he leaned over and touched her lips. Candles cast their glare on the walls, but two lonely people who happened to meet in this life were no longer lonely. And Don peeked through the window and found Sophie and George in the same bed. He was sleeping soundly, cradling her in his arms, and she was smiling in her sleep, walking with him along the bank of the world's most wonderful river. Mark and Julie immediately noticed that the ice and misunderstanding between Sophie and George had melted. Now they preferred to get together at the cottage. And one day George brought there his son, 10-year-old Daniel. Daniel quickly found common ground with Julie, who told him about the plants growing in the vicinity of the country house. That evening Mark was up in the attic writing some kind of article about the gaming industry, and Julie and Danya were squatting by the ant hill. The girl was lecturing the boy about the life of ants. Danya listened to her with his mouth hanging open. Sophie and George sat in chairs on the veranda, watching the November rain wander across their lawn and drinking mint tea. Ah, it's great to have a big family, the man said suddenly, like you're living somehow for a reason. Yeah, and I kept hoping I'd be around my husband in my old age, with grandchildren around, and it turned out to be what it was. Sophie took a sip of tea and smiled, and yet, is it worth complaining about? Absolutely not, Sophie, he gleamed his eyes. And do you want me to find you someone from my database, Sophie suggested playfully, come to my club, we have nice and lots of single women. You know, sometimes you meet such diamonds, you're amazed no one pays any attention to them. Everybody wants long-legged, young, fresh-faced women. I don't want to, George said quietly, and I'm not going to your club. It's just that I've already got my eye on someone. Yeah, I congratulate you. Sophie smiled warmly at George and added in a whisper, you know, I found someone, too. Julie, chatting with Daniel, glanced in the direction of George and her mother-in-law whispering, and answered the boys' questions inappropriately a couple of times. Julie was thinking about something of her own, and Sophie noticed nothing but George's happy eyes shining and giving him her affectionate smiles that melted something in his heart, and filled his soul with warmth. Sophie thought that now the past was gone and left her forever. But the next night, when the woman returned home from the club, she found not only Mark and Julie there, but also Ben. He was sitting in the kitchen, with a huge bouquet of red roses on the table, wrapped in newspaper for some reason. Hello, Sophie, Ben said quietly, I've decided to come back to you. Mother, I'm sorry, I couldn't chase him away, Mark glanced angrily at his father, and he really wanted to see you. Sophie tried to hide her excitement. Lily chased you away, didn't she? You know already, Ben lowered his head, yes, it didn't work out with her, you know, not as well with the young one as it did with you. If it had worked out with you, you wouldn't have come back here, would you?" asked Mark. Well, why would you, son, Ben tried to squeeze out a smile, but he failed. Sophie, take me back, it doesn't feel right. When I left you, I thought I was in my second youth, but I was, Ben waved his hand. Sophie looked intently at her ex-husband. He had lost a lot of weight, grey shadows under his eyes, and he must have really suffered in his relationship with his young wife. Well, what do you think? Sophie listened to herself. Inside her there was pity maybe only, sympathy, a little resentment and that was it. The woman had no other feelings for Ben. Mark stood over his father, arms crossed over his chest. Julie was probably sitting in the room. Sophie was grateful for the girl's delicacy and for choosing not to interfere in family matters. Ben, unfortunately, it's too late. It's been a long time. I'd love to give you a hug and a kiss and tell you that everything will be like it used to be. But it's just not going to be like before, you know? Well, give me at least one chance, Ben's voice wavered. I'm sorry, but no, Sophie answered him briefly. Did you get someone? asked Ben. Yes, as you can see you're not alone in this world, the woman muttered. Well, that's all right, the man grinned, it won't be long. 
he got up slowly and headed for the door. The roses were still on the table. When the door closed behind Ben, Mark grabbed the bouquet and tried to shove it into the trash can. Sophie, however, stopped him. Son, calm down, the flowers are not to blame for anything. Look at him, Mark said indignantly, come on. He stopped calling me, and he stopped calling you, too. And now he's asking me to take him back. Father's got to try harder to get along with us. Well, you wouldn't mind if Ben came and visited us, would you? Asked Julie, who appeared in the doorway, you can't be so mean. He loves you, and you love him, too. Mind your own business, snapped Sophie to her sister-in-law, please take care of your own life and leave me alone. Mother, why are you being so rude, wondered Mark. Are you blind, laughed Julie, yes, your mother is being taken care of by our precious Moore. Apparently, he decided to chase us out of our house. Found a lonely woman, so he's doing his best to please her. Mark, Julie, stop it, exclaimed Sophie, and stop spying on me. I've noticed it more than once before. Mark, don't listen to her, cried Julie, and then turned to Sophie, and don't shut my mouth, I know everything and see everything myself. And the girl ran out of the room. A distraught Mark hurried after her, and Sophie went to her room. She closed herself in there, trying to calm herself down somehow. Was the girl really right? And suddenly, all Moore wanted from her was the house, half of which she had a rightful claim to. Has Sophie once again misjudged the man and trusted him in vain? Well, it may well be so. God, why am I so stupid, exclaimed Sophie, nervously clutching her fingers and then tapping herself on the forehead with her palm, aren't you stupid? And that's the way you should be. Sophie suddenly thought about her ex-husband. Maybe she should confide in him, tell him about more, about what had happened between them. What was the big deal? Ben had cheated on her, she hadn't started the war in the first place. But now they would have a chance to reconcile. After all, now it turns out they are on an equal footing with each other. He had this lily, and she had more. Ben should understand, especially since he's always had a pragmatic mind and a sober way of looking at things. And Mark seems ready to forgive him, too. Sophie sighed and tossed in the cold bed for hours, remembering Ben and George, she tried to compare them, but immediately dismissed the silly thoughts. After all, the men were too different. But worst of all, Sophie could not make sense of herself. It really tormented and depressed her. Winter came and immediately brought heavy snowfalls. During this time Sophie hardly saw more, but Ben kept showing up at home and at the club. Each time he brought Sophie flowers and swore his love. Once Ben got down on his knees, begging him to forgive him, but Sophie wouldn't listen to her ex-husband. Several times she wanted to have a conversation with him about Muga and the house situation, but each time something stopped her. And suddenly the woman realized that she really missed George and wanted to see him again. Except that for some reason he didn't call her. Sophie picked up the phone a couple of times to dial the familiar number, but she didn't dare. She didn't want George to think she was intrusive and just waited for him to make the first move. But for some reason Moore was in no hurry to make one. Meanwhile, preparations for New Year's Eve festivities were underway at the club, and Sophie often stayed there late. She and her assistants enjoyed creating a New Year's atmosphere in the fireplace room, where they decorated a lush, beautiful Christmas tree, elegant and even somewhat aristocratic. It was very similar to the Christmas trees in the pictures in the glossy magazines, and Sophie was very proud of her creation. A slight sadness touched the woman's heart when she thought that this New Year's Eve she would most likely celebrate alone. Maybe she should forgive her ex-husband. Let all bad things remain in the past. And then the new year will bring them both joy and happiness. Sophie looked in the antique mirror and smiled to herself. Yes, let it be so. Today he would come again to ask her forgiveness, and she would graciously forgive Ben. After all, there was no point in changing anything anymore. Sophie mentally smiled at her joke, and then she heard the phone ring. What if it was George, but Julie's anxious voice rang out. Sophie, there's been an accident with your Moore. He just got off the phone with me and said you weren't picking up for some reason. Yes? 
Julie, where is he? exclaimed Sophie. There, in the back of the house. Okay, I got it. In five minutes Sophie ran out into the parking lot, but her car would not start for some reason. In desperation, the woman rushed to look for a cab, and then, next to her, some car stopped. Do you need a ride somewhere? the male driver asked, I see you're in a hurry. Yes, please. I need to go to the village, out of town. I'll pay. Get in, he nodded and got out to help Sophie. Instead of closing the door, however, he made an elusive movement with his hand, and Sophie passed out instantly, not noticing a trickle of warm blood running down her temple. She regained consciousness and immediately groaned at the unbearable pain that pierced her head. She put her hand to her temple and immediately her fingers touched something sticky. My head, Sophie moaned, it hurts so bad. Somebody help me. She thought she was calling loudly, but in fact the woman was barely whispering the words with her lips stiffened by the cold. Her voice went completely hollow, and poor Sophie realized that she was in real trouble, and there was no one around to help her. Sophie tried to focus her vision to see where she was in the thickening twilight, and when she realized it was the forest, she groaned again. Tears streamed down her cheeks, instantly turning to ice, the cold creeping under her clothes, freezing the woman's heart all over her body. We must go, Sophie thought, or I'll stay here forever. God, who would do this to me? She remembered that it had been Julie who had called her and told her that something had happened to Moore. Why hadn't Sophie thought to call George at that moment? Why had she decided to go somewhere and save someone? What could she have done if trouble had really happened to him in that house? Or maybe it was just his cunning plan to get rid of Sophie. Then it turns out Moore is in cahoots with Julie. He gets the house, and she gets freedom with the apartment. There they are, the people of the orphanage, nothing can fix them. But what a mean Julie, unscrupulous. And to live there on purpose, to peep and eavesdrop on Sophie. Of course, because she had spied on her so many times. Sophie just couldn't help but notice it. We've got to get out of here, Sophie exhorted herself, come on, come on, or you'll freeze. Somewhere out there is her son Mark, and he lives with this Julie who wanted to get rid of her, Sophie. Mark, son, help. The woman pleaded as she continued to climb out of the snowy captivity that did not want to let her go at all. The frozen snow scratched the freezing Sophie's hands, and the ever-increasing snowfall threw its flakes in her face, sprinkling icy, sharp needles down her scruff. But she continued to crawl through the icy crust, knowing that if she didn't do it now, she would stay in the woods forever. And pretty soon the fresh snow would cover the tracks left by her captor, and then Sophie would not be able to find her way to any shelter. A dreadful wolf howl seemed to begin to motivate the floundering woman in the snow. At last Sophie managed to get out on a narrow path, and, falling and rising again and again, she walked along it, trying to avoid a terrible death. But her strength left her, and she fell to her blood-soaked knees as she whispered her last words to God. The wolf's mouth was already very close to her fading vision. Sophie managed to see the huge yellow fangs of the ferocious beast. When Sophie opened her eyes, she thought she was still in the forest. After all, everything around her was blindingly white, but she no longer felt the cold, and there was no pain either. Maybe I'm already dead, Sophie thought, not noticing that she was saying these words out loud. Something moved nearby, and the woman flinched in fright, thinking it was a wolf. But instead of a terrifying howl a voice so familiar and so caring was heard. Don't even dream of it. Sophie lifted herself up on her elbow and saw a smiling George in front of her. Well, at last, my dear, I'm going crazy here, and you still won't come to your senses. Why, why did you do that, she asked. Did what, wondered more. You wanted to kill me. Silly, we saved you. Moore crouched down beside her and took Sophie's hand. He was about to begin his story, but at that moment Mark and Julie entered the room. Mommy, you finally came to your senses. George and I were always on duty around you. With George? Yes, well, what else should I call your future husband, smiled Mark, he told us everything. Now I know you two love each other. What about Daddy, asked Sophie. 
It's all his own fault, Mark told the woman, so you'd better let Julie tell you all about it. The girl stepped forward. Forgive me, Sophie, she said, but I really thought I was only doing what was best for you. You see, when you quarreled with Ben, I felt very sorry for you, honestly. I could hear you crying, I could see you were missing him, and then he came over. I was home alone that day, Mark had to work late. I was very surprised to see Ben on the doorstep. Of course, I invited him in, gave him some tea, and he told me the story of your life. He talked at great length about how you loved each other, that you couldn't live without each other. And that he never thought it would work out that way. You see, it just so happened that Lily had imposed herself, and he just couldn't resist. That night they were out celebrating something at a bar with some friends, and she came up to him and asked him to dance. He was a little drunk, so he fell for the pretty girl. Ben said it was just a drunken obsession, he wanted to show everyone that despite his age he was still being approached by young beauties. Anyway, he couldn't resist the temptation then, but he thought it would only work once and no one would know anything. But it wasn't so easy to get rid of Lily. She turned out to be too persistent, began to pursue him, threatened to tell you. Ben berated himself for being weak, but there was nothing he could do about it. And then Lily decided to separate you altogether. Ben was stunned when he found out that she had come to your club and then showed up at your house. You know, I remember her. It was the day I first came to visit you. You still had other girls and boyfriends back then. Anyway, anyway, Lily got you guys broken up, but Ben continued to love you. He asked me to help him get back in the family. And I didn't agree at first, I didn't want to get involved in your relationship, but he managed to convince me. And most importantly, I saw how unhappy you were without him. Remember that money I gave you to buy a house? I also said that I got that money from my grandmother. Forgive me, but I deceived you. That money was given to me by Ben. To be honest, I thought it was a very noble gesture, and I wanted to tell you everything, but he asked me not to, because he knew how proud you were. Also, he was very afraid that you would give up the money and lose that wonderful house you dreamed of. And everything would have been fine, but then George came into your life. You know, I thought you were being unfair to your ex-husband and I was very angry with you about it. Please forgive me, I was so stupid, I didn't understand anything. A few days ago Ben came to me again and asked me to help him. I had to call you and tell you that George was in trouble. I cried and didn't want to do it, but then he threatened to tell Mark and you too, you know, about the money for the house and everything else. He said I was his accomplice. Julie stopped talking and sobbed. Mark held his spouse close to him. Now, now, baby, you don't have to cry. You've told everything now, and it makes you feel better. Really? Wait, Sophie rounded her eyes, so what, Ben wanted to kill me? No, he didn't mean to kill you, George sighed, his plan was to suspect me of kidnapping you. He was sure Julie would keep quiet and not tell anyone anything. And you and I have a common problem with the house. And if you went missing, it would only benefit me. Right? That's what your husband thought, so he turned the tables on me with no qualms about it. He hired someone, paid the man well to kidnap you. Except the rascal hit you on the head. He was afraid he actually killed you, so he took you to the woods and just left you there. He did not even take you to the right place, where Ben was waiting for you. The doer of this kidnapping himself went into hiding. They are looking for him, and I am sure they will find him soon. So it turns out that the plan was for Ben to be your savior, as it were, to take his place in your heart forever, Sophie. It would have come out very, of course, beautifully. I'm bad because I kidnapped you to get my whole house, and he's good because he found you and saved you. Ben, in fact, has been all over the neighborhood, but he was looking for you where that bandit promised to take you. Your ex-husband had no idea that his partner in crime, scared out of his wits, had abandoned you somewhere else. Understand? So, basically, things didn't go according to plan and now Ben is testifying to the police. But who found me, Sophie looked helplessly at the faces of her son, daughter-in-law, and her beloved George. Julie called me and told me all about it, more reported, well, after that, it was very simple. 
I didn't tell you, but I'm actually a police lieutenant colonel, though I run a business, too, though half with my brother. The firm is registered in his name, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, I got in touch with Ben very quickly through my own channels and got everything straight from him. He really freaked out when he realized what he had done and Julie too, but you can't blame her. I mean, she genuinely wanted to help you. Yeah, Sophie nodded and suddenly flinched, but in the woods, in the woods, I was alone and wolves. They came. No, no, mommy, said Mark, it wasn't the wolf that found you, it was the woodsman. And you almost made it to his cabin. Lucky for you, he was just there, and when he heard his dog howling, he came out to see what happened. Well he found you, there were no wolves. The ranger radioed what had happened, the information was passed on to George, and he immediately rushed after you with a rescue team, they were the ones who took you to the hospital. George didn't leave your side the whole time you were unconscious, mammy. Thank you, George, Sophie held out her hand to him. The main thing is to get well soon, Moore smiled. The next day Julie and Mark arrived at the hospital first. Sophie was feeling better, looking at the fluffy snowflakes slowly floating outside the window. The woman smiled. Sophie, will you excuse me, Julie began. Sophie looked at the girl attentively, then smiled, and immediately a smile spread across Mark's face. Julie, sweetheart, of course my mother will forgive you. Can she be mad at the mother of her future grandchild? Mark slapped himself on the forehead. Oh crap, that's not what we wanted to tell you, it just slipped out. Sophie cried out, keeping her eyes on her son. Grandson? Julie, are you pregnant? Well yes, Mark laughed, 12 weeks. We were thinking of ordering a cake when we found out the sex. Well, when it's a boy, the filling is blue, and if it's a girl, the filling would be pink. Son, 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 what are you saying? Julie, Julie dear, is he, is he telling the truth, exclaimed Sophie. Well yes, you're going to be a grandmother soon. Sophie blushed. Julie. I never had time to tell you about it. So much has been piling up. And I'm very ashamed of what happened. My girl, tears glistened in Sophie's eyes, I'm so glad. And don't you think I'm not angry with you at all? I understand you perfectly. And I'm sorry, too. I've been thinking a lot of silly things about you. It's so unpleasant. Julie, but now, I see that my son made the right choice. You're a big smart girl, Julie. I love you, Julie leaned over and hugged her mother-in-law. What will happen to Ben now? Sophie suddenly asked after a brief silence, I don't want him to go to jail. Let him live as he knows how. But only in freedom. I'll try to help him, Moore's appearance in the ward came just in time, the money he added to you to buy the house, I already gave him back. And do not be afraid, he is not in jail, but just under house arrest. If you want, he'll even come and check on you. No, I don't want to, Sophie shook her head, let him live as he knows, and away from me, the woman repeated, several days passed. Ben came to Sophie at the hospital after all. I want to ask for your forgiveness, the man said, and I also want to thank you for not reporting me to the police. Of course, I was questioned, but you're more turned out to be a rather noble man. Anyway, they dropped all the charges against me. Well, that's good, said Sophie to him, Ben, now go away. You know, I'm back with Lily. She's expecting a baby. I don't know why I should at this age, but you can't change anything anymore. Sophie, and I wanted so much to go back to you, not her. But now you'll have to live for this baby. Well, that's wonderful, the woman nodded, so you'll be a father and a grandfather at the same time. Julie's expecting a baby, too. Ben said nothing. After a while he left. Sophie looked after him for a long time, but she wasn't thinking about him, she was waiting for her beloved George to show up on the doorstep. New Year's Eve at the club was in full swing when George Moore approached the microphone and asked for a moment of silence. I'm very happy to meet all of you, he said to the guests present, and I'm also very happy that you'll be witnesses to what's about to happen. 
and unbeknownst to me, a huge bouquet of scarlet roses appeared in his hands. Sophie blushed. She had already realized what was about to happen and when she saw the open box with the gold ring, her eyes sparkled with happiness. I want you, Sophie, to be my wife, George told her, I want us never to part and be together in sickness and in health, in wealth and in poverty. But I hope there won't be the latter, the man smiled, I want to be with you to know what true love is. Will you agree to be my only, unique, and most desirable woman? Sophie, will you be my wife? Yes, replied Sophie, and her answer drowned in the thunder of applause and congratulations. Tears rolled down Sophie's cheeks, but the woman did not hide them, nor was she in the least ashamed. For they were tears of the very happiness she had waited so long for, the very happiness she deserved. An amazing story, isn't it? Thank you for listening till the end. I sincerely hope that you truly enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and rate this video. See you in the comments and in new releases.